Welcome back to Kinetics and Reaction Mechanisms on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. Alright, so here I have a reaction coordinate diagram. All right, and there's different blanks that correspond and are pointed at different points on the reaction coordinate. All right, and we're going to look at what each one is and briefly talk about what it is. All right, so I have some reaction where I'm going from Rx plus a hydrogen radical to Rh plus an X radical, probably a halide radical. Okay. On the Y axis right here, the vertical, we have, if we go up, that's increasing energy and going on the horizontal axis is a reaction coordinate. Now this reaction coordinate is an abstract quantity. It does not represent time. Okay, so it's not like every so units you go is a certain amount of time. It's very, it's just, it's given this way just as a means of convenience. Okay, it means that this unit of time is not exactly this unit of time. Okay, it's just for convenience. It's not time on the x-axis. We want to look at what each part is. So these right here are obviously our reactants, where we're going to call these our starting material. So let's move this right there. Those are our starting material. That's what we start with. Other names for that you can consider reactants, and if you're talking about uh, catalysis by any means, you can call them substrates. If I go from the starting materials and I go up this sort of hill right here and I get to this highest point, this highest point, the high points or the maxima, on each region of the curve, so there's one here, there's one here, these are referred to as the transition states. All right, the transition states. Now, before we go into the transition states, there's another point I want to look at, and it's actually this one that's the local minima. So this is a maxima, this is a maxima, this is a minima or a minimum. The minimum is going to be an intermediate, and I want to go ahead and put that in first. All right. So an intermediate in any reaction that we have, okay, they are going to be more stable than transition states, but intermediates are short-lived. They're not, usually in most cases, we can't isolate them very well. We certainly can't isolate a transition state. We can, if we have the right tools, isolate an intermediate, but it's very, very difficult. So things about intermediates is they're, they are short-lived, but they're more stable than the transition state. Okay, so intermediates are what we call, they're actually more defined molecules that are um, at some point between the reactants over here and the products. They're defined molecules. They're not the final state of the molecule, but they are defined. When we come up to these points, the maxima up here, each maximum is a transition state. Transition states are not defined molecules. Okay, they are conditions in which bonds are in the middle of breaking and forming. Okay, they're not defined molecules. You cannot isolate a transition state. You can isolate an intermediate if you have the right tools, but it's still very hard. They're short-lived. Transition states are where the bonds are in the process of being broken and formed. You cannot isolate those. So we have two transition states, and we're, one of them is rate-limiting, the other is non-rate-limiting. To discuss what is rate limiting, we have to look at activation energy. And to do that, I want to do something. It turns out that this is actually a relatively simple coordinate diagram. What I'm actually allowed to do is I'm actually allowed to add every minima that I have, every, every intermediate, and there can be more than one, there could be five. I'm going to draw a line. Oops, that's not a good one. Um, let me make sure it's good. That's decent. I can actually separate the curve at each intermediate and I can look at each individual part. So there could be five intermediates, in which case I'm going to put five lines, because one through each intermediate, I'm going to look at each one separately. All right? I'm going to look essentially as if the reactants are a defined energy, and this intermediate and any other intermediate is a defined energy. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to draw a line, as they have here already. I'm going to draw a line over here. This is the dotted line. All right? like this. And I'm going to go from the transition state right here down to where I hit that line. Okay? I'm going to do the same thing over for the intermediate. I'm going to draw a line over here and then go from this transition state down to that line. 
Now my question to you is, is the red vertical line bigger or smaller than the orange vertical line? In other words, which one's larger? Well, clearly the red one's larger. In other words, I'm going to designate it this way. This is my first activation energy. So activation energy one for the first step. This is my activation energy for the second step. You actually have more than one activation energy. All right, there's more than one. However, because the step with the largest activation energy is the rate limiting step and the reaction can only proceed as fast as that step goes, we more or less, we, we neglect any other activation energy that's smaller than the largest activation energy because it doesn't matter how, how, how big this activation energy is, this one is much larger. And so the reaction is only going to proceed as if this is the only one because this is the slowest step. This is the rate limiting step. So as a result, let me go back to my tools. First of all, this is the rate limiting transition state right there. Okay, And also the activation energy will only be defined for this one right here this hump right here. We don't define it for the second one because that activation energy is smaller. It doesn't matter. In pretty much every case you're going to see, the first hump is going to have the largest activation energy. Okay. Generally the ones that come after it, if any, are going to be smaller. Okay. Now that makes this transition state right here the non-rate limiting transition state. It's non-rate limiting because its activation energy is not as big as the rate limiting activation energy right here. In other words, this orange vertical line is smaller than the red vertical line for the rate limiting transition state. All right. I can go ahead and label the products. The products are just what are over here, RH plus X radical. All right. I go from starting materials or reactants or substrates to products. And if I look at the difference in energy, meaning the difference in energy between the reactants and the products, and that's what they've done here. Let me go ahead and extend this a little bit. So they're looking at this right there and this. If I look at the difference in energy right there, okay, that quantity, if assuming this energy is at the enthalpy form, this is my delta H. okay. And as a result, because it's the difference in energy between reactants and products, we're going to term that the enthalpy change for this reaction. Okay? If this energy right here were given in free energy, as in Gibbs free energy, this would not be the enthalpy change, it would be the Gibbs free energy change, or delta G. If this were instead entropy, this would be the entropy change, or delta S, and so on and so forth. However, we are going to assume that on the axis here, this is enthalpy given by H. So this difference in energy between reactants and products is the enthalpy change, delta H. All right. So these are going to be the main parts for a two-step reaction coordinate diagram. In other videos, we'll look at much more complicated ones. All right. So make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.